Hi, I'm Mark Kilgard, and we're resuming part three of the talk and introduction to NV path rendering, discussing GPU accelerated path rendering. Uh, we were finishing up talking about how to query glyph spacing, and that leads right into how to do instance uh, path rendering. So it's often very common to want to stencil multiple path objects in a single call, and uh, this needs to be efficient, particularly for the case of text. So we might have a line of text characters that we want to render in a single call, uh, and then we're going to cover the union of all those characters. One of the reasons that we want to do it this way is to minimize the state changes and overall CPU overhead uh, to make this work right. So there's a couple different uh, calls to do this. They're just like the four calls to um, stencil and cover for fill and stroking. There's basically instanced versions of each one of these calls. So the idea here is that you can give an array of path objects, each with its own transformation, uh, and then each path object gets uh, covered with a unique instance ID. Or you can go and have a bounding box be computed to cover them all in a single box. And this would be really good for a line of text or maybe several lines of text. So here's actually the parameter for instance filling. And you can see it's actually a lot like uh, the command for just doing GL stencil fill path without instance, uh, except it's got all these additional parameters where you can pass in an array of paths. Um, you can have a type for what those paths are and a path base. And you give it an array of transformations. Uh, and there's a couple different transform types that are supported. The cover operation looks pretty similar again. Uh, stroking is the same sort of thing, except there's stroking specific parameters. So one of the things that path rendering, NV path rendering makes sure to support is first class resolution independent font support. And that's because fonts are a standard first class part of all path rendering systems. If you look at path rendering, they're always going to have support for fonts, whether it's PostScript or PDF or Flash or SVG or OpenVG. Um, this is just standard. Now, that's kind of foreign to people that are used to 3D graphic systems where OpenGL and D3D don't normally support fonts and they don't support you know, any way to load any particular kind of model data. But this is actually really natural for path rendering because the glyphs in fonts really are defined as path outlines. So TrueType and PostScript and OpenType fonts specify all of their glyphs as outlines. And NV path rendering makes it really easy to support fonts. You can specify a range of path objects for a specified font and a sequence or range of Unicode character points and it will populate those path object names with uh, path outlines that correspond to the glyphs of that particular font. And there's no requirement for applications to use the font API in NV path rendering. You can go and you load the glyphs yourself if you want to. Um, but one of the nice things about using the interface that's available in NV path rendering is it provides operating system portability. So you can use the same API on Windows or uh, Linux or Solaris and be able to uh, get to the fonts the, the same basic way. So there's three ways to specify a font. There's a system font name, which would be um, whatever the kind of name of fonts on that system is. So things like Arial, but it could be whatever true type fonts were, happen to be installed on that particular machine. Um, on Windows, we use the native Win32 font services to get access to these. On Linux, we expect to be able to uh, access font config and the free type 2 library. So there really is doing it the same way a native application on that system would, would take Arial and map it to a font. Another way to do things is with the uh, GL standard font name. And these are three standard fonts that are available on all platforms, and they're based on the, the Deja Vu fonts. And they're guaranteed to be available no matter what. They're essentially built into the driver. Uh, lastly, you can actually go and specify a font file name. And then if free type 2 is available, uh, we can go ahead and use that. Um, so this works on Windows if the DLL is available. It also just works on Linux because you can pretty much expect that free type 2 is, is supported on Linux. Uh, here's a initial, an example of how to initialize uh, 
some glyphs for, for a font. And first we're going to allocate an unused range of glyphs with GL genpaths and V. And then we're going to go and take a string that's OpenGL. It's got six characters in it. We're just going to populate each one of those characters. Um, and we're going to call GL path glyphs in V. Pass in our glyph base, which is 2048. So we're going to have 2048, 49, 50, 51, all, you know, all the way through six. Those, and we're going to ask that a Helvetica font be populated, um, and then we're going to we're going to ask that it, uh, the bold version of it be provided, and we give uh, however many characters there are in OpenGL six, and we specify that we've got this word that's going to be in unsigned bytes, and we're going to skip over missing glyphs, and then we we've got this. Uh, path template which is nothing so we're going to fill it in with the defaults and then we want to scale it to match true type scaling conventions um, which is 2048. Um, Postscript has a, a different convention. Now we're also going to go and provide backup font faces in case Helvetica is not there. So next we're going to go and, and do the same basic thing over the same range but we're going to say we're going to use Arial which is more likely to be on systems uh, than Helvetica is, because uh, Arial is a very common true type font. But if that's not available, we're going to fall back to a standard font name, which is the Sans font, and provide that. So Helvetica and Arial and Sans are all sans serif fonts. And so by repeating these calls, if we got the, the fonts loaded in with Helvetica, the last two calls would be essentially no ops. But if we didn't, uh, then these last calls would if Helvetica failed, Arial would map in, and if Arial failed, which is unlikely to, um, but if it did, we could always fall back to the SANS uh, uh, built-in standard font. So, uh, oh, here is an. Uh, let's see, here's uh, the way you would do pre-rendering. Would be for, we want to do just some simple horizontal layout, and we're going to call GL path spacing NV to get accumulated adjacent pairs and we're going to make a sequence of offsets that are going to be x translate offsets and we're going to use the um, we're going to use the sequence a set of characters that just goes 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 to go make all this stuff work um, and then we're going to query some per font metric ones to figure out on a font-wide basis, and we just pick any particular character, the glyph base works fine, and we want to find the Y min and Y max. And now we're going to initialize a canvas to window transform with an orthographic projection that's essentially going to allow us to map the entire six characters of OpenGL uh, into the, the viewable range of the window. Uh, now we're going to clear the window, and um, if the window has been damaged or it just has been created we need to clear the stencil buffer otherwise we just clear the color buff we use some glut api to kind of indicate this and now we're going to go stencil hello world into the frame buffer this is the stencil step so we call gl stencil fill path instanced we provide our text uh, with our font base and we're going to use the default um, counting mode and fill mask and we're going to give it our array of X offsets uh, that we got from GL get path spacing in V on the previous slide. Now coming back that's going to stencil everything in place. Now we're going to cover uh, cover that string um, OpenGL or hello world whatever it is. Uh, we're going to enable the stencil test and we're going to say not equal to zero. We're going to have our mask BFF and then we're going to say you know hey if it was not equal to zero let's set it back to zero let's set the color to be blue and then let's do a cover operation using those same set of translates and we're going to make sure our coverage mode is a bounding box of bounding boxes which is going to be really good for text um, just to be gratuitous we can disable the stencil test now we can do glut swap buffers and we can uh, delete the paths if we wanted to really clean up everything another way to do things is map an entire range of characters in fact you could map an entire Unicode font like this. You'd give it a Unicode range, so it would be over a million Unicode characters, and we'd call GL Gen Pass, and and we would use GL Path Glyph Range to ask for that entire range to be mapped in. 
And that's really nice because now we would have a fully populated set of characters so we could draw international text. We can do this again for Helvetica being highest priority and then Arial and then Sans. I'll mention that for the standard font names uh, you're only guaranteed to have the Latin 1 uh, character set, so kind of the first 256 characters of Unicode um, mapped in there. Um, now when we want to name a sequence of path objects um, we need to do that in the instance commands uh, but we also can do that when we get uh, path metrics and spacing and you can pass in an array of path object names with a particular type and we support all the types that display lists support along with special modes to parse uh, UTF-8 or the Unicode transformation format for 8-bit and 16-bit encodings and this allows UTF strings uh, Unicode strings to basically be directly specified for OpenGL um, path rendering which is really cool uh, so you're ready to handle international applications. Now there's a bunch of other neat stuff that you can do with NV path rendering like um, like things like radial gradients and here's an example where because we've got the GPU which is really great at texture mapping uh, filtering operations are extremely cheap so we can do all the standard texture mapping operations like MIP mapping and anisotropic filtering and do all the wrap modes. And this is really actually pretty expensive for CPUs typically in, in path rendering APIs like QT or Cairo they don't really support this so what you see is these really bad Moriae artifacts in this particular scene where on the GPU you actually get this nice stable purple pattern which is really what you would want to see. Now these Moriae patterns if we moved around on the screen these would animate extremely poorly and be very unsightly where on the GPU this is just a very nice stable properly anti-aliased um, um, color ramp. Now we can also do uncommon things in path rendering systems like be able to support projection. Projection just works. GPUs are really good at doing everything perspective correct and using a perspective correct interpolation for 3D rendering and it turns out that just works for path rendering um, which uh, makes something that would have been not supported in lots of path rendering standards um, just readily available and extremely fast. Uh, here's an example of a couple different path rendering systems and what happens when you try to do uh, pr projective rendering with them and you notice the GPU with NV path rendering is flawless uh, while Skia does support projective path rendering it can get it wrong in some crazy situations uh, Cairo and QT just really don't support it. Uh, there's also support for geometric queries in NV path rendering so you can do things like ask if a point is inside a filled path or inside a stroke path you can get the arc length of a path um, and you can do that even for different sub ranges of path segments. You can also uh, determine where in object space or path space a particular point is some distance along a path and this is useful for doing text that follows path and these queries are modeled on the kind of queries that are available in OpenVG and they're fully consistent with the way the paths are actually rendered and they even work with uh, path styles like like dashing. Now one thing that's worth covering is how exactly um, pixels get drawn when you're using NV path rendering and you're doing that stencil or that cover operation and this kind of reviews what's really going on in the pipeline so when you either do stenciling or covering a path is transformed by OpenGL's current model view projection matrix and that's a 4x4 four four, um, projective transform that you get to do and so it means that 2D coordinates that are in the form XY01 in homogeneous space uh, in object space can get transformed such that they have depth and we'll return to that a little later. Um, now when you fill or stroke stenciling there's this idea of accessible samples and, access and a sample is not accessible if any of the following apply to the sample. Uh, it's clipped away by user defined or view custom clip planes the polygon stipple discards it if that's enabled it's discarded by the pixel ownership test if you're sort of obscured by another window um, the scissor test works if it's enabled the depth test can work if it's enabled 
and you can displace depth values during the stencil step uh, using the special GL path stencil depth offset in V command. That's a lot like the GL polygon offset command, but it, it works specifically for the stencil um, step for path rendering. You can discard uh, pixels if the depth test is, um, if, sorry, if the stencil test is enabled, and you can discard them implicitly by the, the stencil test. Uh, and so there's a special command to configure the stencil test function uh, when you're actually stenciling a path. And the idea here is that you actually get to look at the set of bits that aren't being manipulated by the stencil operation. Okay, so let's look at what interesting things you can do with that. And here's an example of being able to mix depth rendering and path rendering. So here is a scene that has some nice postscript text and we've got a 3D teapot and then we've got a bunch of these tigers surrounding the teapot and they're all being path rendering. There's no texturing going on in this scene. It's not multi-paths. You're basically just doing depth rendering and then you um, render your paths in place as well. So how do you do that? Uh, first of all, in the stencil test, we configure a um, something much like polygon offset with the GL path stencil depth offset command. And then we use, in the stenciling step, we say GL path cover depth func always. So we always um, pass the, the depth test. Uh, now the observation is that we're stencil testing, but we're not writing depth. Now the cover, the cover step is writing depth, but it's not testing depth. Uh, sorry, I should say that this actually is the cover step that should be here. Uh, and this is tricky, but it's neat because there's a minimal amount of mode changes involved in this. Now, let's see what happens if we left out our GL path stencil depth offset in V command, in which case bad things would happen. The tiger's 240 paths, and they would all look like they would Z-fight. But by simply using this command, we can make it all look right. Here's how the paths are actually transformed. They go through um, the se standard sequence of matrices, and this is a lot like what would happen in normal fixed function. Two things that I'll note is you get the ability to um, generate from object space color, texture coordinate sets, and fog coordinates, or you can do that in eye space. You can also generate um, clip coordinates for use in user-defined clip planes. And that's done with the normal fixed function operations of that. So you have the ability to make sure that you have interpolated things that you can use uh, in your fragment shader. Uh, clip planes work. Here's an example of a dragon clipped by all combinations of six clip planes. It just works. Uh, here is scissoring and polygon stipple all uh, just working. And we can use things like the ability to scissor or stencil paths by other paths to basically clip paths to other arbitrary paths. And here's a simple example of the tiger being clipped by a heart that's formed by two cubic Bezier curves, um, which makes a nice little uh, pretty, pretty tiger there. We can even do this for very complicated clipping examples. We can take the tiger and clip it by a cowboy that's actually defined by over 1,300 paths and do that right and be able to do that at interactive rates, which is really quite, quite amazing. So uh, I'm going to drop off here, and in part four, we're going to resume talking about some of the programmable shading that we can do.